Yeah, I fooled Ben. He's not used to me using this microphone. <laughs> okay, well, we've been talking about power struggles. You know, if you are alive, you have encountered a power struggle. Or you will encounter a power struggle. Sometimes the power struggles are between us and God. Where God's trying to say, hey, yo, I'm God. And we're trying to say, hey, God, you answered to me. And God's like, okay, well, this is going to take a lot longer if you keep doing this. Sometimes it's between us and our kids. Uh, you know, they want to fuss and cry all day, and we don't want to hear them fuss and cry all day. <laughs> Just joking, Freya. Uh, <laughs> or sometimes it's between us and our spouse. You know, they want to do something one way, we want to do it a different way. Uh, you know, it's, it, there's a lot, if you're alive, you're going to have a power struggle. And uh, so in, in dealing with power struggles, w- there were four questions that I said we have to ask every single time that we're in a power struggle. And if you, you remember, um, two weeks ago, the first question was, what do I control? That's the first question you should always ask when you're in a power struggle. Because a lot of times, in fact, I'm going to say the majority of our power struggles are because <laughs> we, are <laughs> we are caught in a fight that we should just let go. You know, that, that's about 95% of the struggles in your life. So there's that. Uh, and, and when we were looking at that, we basically said we have a death grip on what's not ours to control. And then last week, uh, the question that we asked was, who has God given me? And we learned to, to start seeing the people who we see as irritants as instead blessings. So uh, rather than nitpicking the government, finding the positive in the government, rather than nitpicking our, our spouse, finding the positive in our spouse. Right? See, I mean, we, go, we went to the different things, and we talked about finding, reframing, asking a different question instead of, God, why have, you, why have you given me this person? Changing it to, God, who have you given me? And once we start seeing especially irritating things as a blessing rather than a curse, it changes everything. It changes how you look at things. It changes how you deal with the situation. It just changes everything. And so this, um, I, I will say this, though, that obviously sometimes with the government and politics and stuff, sometimes we're, we're a little bit um, disappointed by different things that people in government do. And, you know, that, that irritation with the government and that fear of the government and, and that kind of stuff, you know, not, not knowing what tomorrow is going to bring with the economy and all these different things, that is a great opportunity to learn to trust God in those areas. Did you know that Christians have endured bad politics before? Did you know that Christians have endured a failing government before? Did you know that Christians have... God's got this. God's got this. And these different things that, that cause us great angst are really just another, another opportunity for us to learn to trust God in a new and different way. So once you start seeing things a little bit differently, it really changes things. So the question we're going to ask this week, what am I obligated to do? Okay, if I know what's in my, what's in my power, if I know, you know, who has God given me, the next question is, so what am I obligated to do for those people that God has given me? What's the bare minimum that I have to contribute to the government, to my spouse, to whatever, whoever are the people that God has strategically placed in your life? What is the bare minimum that I have to do for that? And I think that this question is really accented very well by this picture. And it says, my wife called her on her way home after a long day at work and asked me to run her some hot water and not to forget the bubbles. Hope she'll be happy. She's so sweet, love her to bits. It's a kitchen sink filled up with hot water and, 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 and dish soap. And I think that that really summarizes the question that we're looking at this week. What is the bare minimum that I can contribute to this from, that, that God requires me to do? Like, it, it, can I just do just enough to weasel by and then God will be happy and I can just move on? Okay, so let's, let's look at that. Um, but I will say we often give minimal uh, effort to a lot of the biggest things in our life. Um, a lot of times when we have jobs, we don't give it our really best effort. We're just there kind of to get a paycheck. You know what I mean? We're not really there to, to do a good job. Um, we, we don't really do the things that we do with, 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 with not, not pride in a bad way, but pride in a good way. Like, when I was in Royal Rangers, they taught us this thing. They said, every time you, anytime you go to a camping site, you want to leave the camping spot better than you found it when you got there. And it was this idea of being, being proud that you were a Christian and showing that by going the extra mile. And it was really an important lesson for me as a, as a as a kid, and I really did learn from it a lot, and I think that it's uh, really what I'm looking at here. 
Um, another thing that we kind of give minimal effort to a lot of the times is, is our family, especially as men. We work all day. We're tired. We come home. The last thing we want to do is help clean or help cook or take care of the kid. We just want to zone out on the TV. We, we're tired, yeah, and I totally get it. Um, but I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that's okay. I'm just saying I understand it. You know, I'm a guy too. Um, and there's a lot of things that we really just give minimal effort to. Sometimes w- with the church we give a minimal effort, not, not with volunteering. I'm not trying to recruit you guys to volunteer for everything. But what I'm saying is doing things with, with a bad attitude. Pretend like, pretend like, okay, so let me give you just an example. I'm not talking about our pastor. I'm just, this is a hypothetical, okay? Let's say that there's a pastor who does all kinds of things, but he has just a crappy attitude, and you can tell he doesn't care at all for you. See what I mean? Now, he's doing it, but he's not really doing it. You see what I'm saying? And that's kind of what I'm talking about. A lot of times when we do church stuff, we kind of have this attitude, they're lucky I'm doing anything at all. You know, we kind of just have this attitude like, like they owe me for contributing to the, to the cause, to the greater good. You know, and, and it's something that's inside of each of us, so don't try and tell me, no, I don't do that. We, we all do that to a little bit. All of us. I'm talking about me here, too. So it's not like, you know, you guys. I'm talking about all of us. We all have this little bit in us that when we're doing stuff, it's like, you should really notice my contribution here. And... Uh, Sometimes we do the same with government, too. Uh, you know, well, I voted. Well, are you, are you praying for people? Are you, are you having civil conversations with people? So the big question here, what is, what is the bare minimum that I can do and get away with? The fr- I'm going to list about five things, and then I'm going to just say a few other things, and, and then we're going to just kind of wrap it up very um, nice with a little bow. So first off, pray for them. This is your first, the bare minimum that you have to do. You have to be praying for your spouse. You have to be praying for your government. You have to be praying, uh, what was the other groups, for your church leaders and your church members too. You have to be praying for your boss and, and your fellow workers. This is something, that this is the bare minimum of what you have to do. First Timothy 2, 1 through 2 puts it exactly like this. First of all then, I urge, first of all being before we get into anything else, <laughs> I urge, you, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. So we're not talking about just authority here. We're talking about on all men. Okay, all right. Now let's, verse 2, for kings and all who are in authority so that w- we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. A lot of important things that he just said there. I don't have a whole lot of time to get into that. So we're just going to go ahead and go to the second thing. Um, well, before I do that, let me just say this. Pray for them, not against them. So, there's that. Judging from the look on your guys' face, you all understand what I'm saying. (laughs) So I'm not going to belabor that point. Um, (laughs) Okay, so then uh, another thing that we are, the bare minimum that we are required to do, just the bare minimum... Do it as you are, as if you were doing it to God. Now, this one is a little bit difficult, especially if you have a boss who's a pain in the butt, or if your spouse is being a little bit of a turd, you know, or different things like that. You know, sometimes you're just not really going to feel like doing this. But it's important to remember that just because you don't feel like doing it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You get what I'm saying? You're going to have disagreements with people. Make sure that you don't stop acting like Jesus just because you're in the middle of a, of a conflict. You see what I'm saying? Well, we do. Men, men do this a lot. I love my wife as long as she's giving me sex. The instant she says no, what do I do? I hate this woman. All she does is nag me. I mean, men do it all the time. You, 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 guys, don't look so innocent. You, you know that you do. Here's a good verse that goes along with that. Colossians 3, 22 through 24 says, In all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do you work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward, I'm sorry, sorry from the Lord you will receive the reward <laughs> of the inheritance. It is the Lord Jesus Christ whom you serve. See, now, once you start seeing it as that, it changes things quite a bit. Now, we're not just talking about uh, in the church here. We're talking about your spouse. We're talking about your boss. We're talking about how you deal with political issues. 
Do what you do as if you're doing it to God. Don't have a double-minded heart where, you know, you, you pretend to be one person in one place and then you, you show a different side of you in a different place. Be you. You know what I mean? Be, be, be the real you. Don't, don't pretend to be someone else. And a lot of times when we're doing stuff, we do it with grumbling or complaining or gossiping. And for that, we have to realize that that's not doing it as to God. You cannot possibly be doing it as if to God if you're complaining about it the whole time. Like, God, I'm really doing you a favor here. It's like, okay, well, let me tell you the favor that I did you, you know, when I made you. You know, so it's a little bit, a little bit uh, off balance there. So then a third thing, the bare minimum that we have to, have to contribute here is to make peace. Now get this, even if you didn't do anything wrong, still make peace. Matthew 5, 9 puts it like this. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now we know, those of us who have, who have accepted Jesus as our Savior, we are Christians. We know that God calls us sons of God, right? Sons and, and daughters. Sons and daughters of God. Sons of God is just kind of a, a, a generalized term. Sons and daughters of God. Okay, so that would mean that God requires for every single one of the people who call themselves Christians to be a peacemaker as well. Right? Doesn't that, doesn't that follow? So in other words, what he's saying is, if you, if you want to be a Christian, you also have to be a peacemaker. You can't go in there just causing problems. Um, and before we go to the next point, I just kind of want to think about this for a second. Are we making peace when we talk about politics? Now, I'm not saying that you, that you, can't, have a disagreeing, that you can't have a disagreement. What I'm talking about are those hateful and divisive conversations that we too often have where it's kind of like us versus them or you versus me. So, like, for instance, um, you know, we've got the Trump supporters and then we have anybody who doesn't believe that Trump is Jesus. See what I mean? And it's like, well, no, you don't understand. Trump is, is Jesus, you know. And then you so see you have these other people over here who, Trump did this wrong and Trump did this wrong and Trump did this wrong. It's, it's okay to have disagreements. If you love Trump, good for you. If you don't, that's fine too. I, I'm not here to convert you to the gospel of Trump. I'm here to convert you to the gospel of Jesus. Okay, that's a very important distinction. Okay? Um, and part of the thing that's important to remember with that is if you're going to have a disagreement, that's fine. Don't be hateful. Don't be hateful. I guarantee you there will be people who make it into heaven who, who did not like Trump. I guarantee you. And there will be people who supported Obama, too, who will be in heaven. That's not a requirement of, of salvation, okay? I, it seems like a lot of times lately we're told that we have to draw this line in the sand, and we're told that we can't disagree with one another or we have to be hateful. It's not like that. You can have a disagreement. That's totally fine. You know, I saw a picture online that was very, very, very re refreshing for me. It was a picture of Ellen DeGeneres sitting next to uh, ex-President Bush, and all kinds of people were on her hide. Oh, why are you sitting with that right-wing nut job? Da, 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 da. And she said this. She said, President Bush is my friend. We have differing opinions, and it's okay to have differing opinions. Yeah, it's really okay. And I was thinking, you know, how sad is it that a non-Christian <laughs> has more sense sometimes than we do as Christians? I mean, that, that's, that's, that, that should kind of somewhat give us a little bit of a reproach, you know, like uh, maybe we should work a little bit harder at, you know, being peacemakers. Um, another good example of where you can make peace at is, is at work. Did you know that most jobs you have are going to have conflict? There's going to be people talking and backbiting. That's why I don't understand people who say, I don't go to church anymore because of all the hypocrites. Buddy, they're everywhere. Don't you, don't you have a job? I mean, when you go and your employees are pretending one minute and you turn your back and they, they're talking behind you to the boss, well, I saw Michael. He wasn't stacking, right? And it's like, what? That's whack, yo. I stopped my job to help you. What are you talking about? You know, anyways, so th th there's another area. Here's another area that, that sometimes we don't make quite the effort that we need to in making peace. Our family. <sighs> Ever walk in when your kids are fighting with your spouse and you're like, and I forgot I left something in the car. <laughs> But, but seriously, though, um, you know, that's just another area that we need, need to watch out for. But let's go ahead and move on. I don't want to belabor any points here. The fourth thing is forgive. And I think, I think this is a very important one, too. This, we're talking about the bare minimum things that we have to do, guys. Look at this list so far. Pray for them. Do as if you were doing it to God. Make peace. Forgive. 
these are some big requirements. Matthew 6.15 says, But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Oh, that is hard, because there's two specific little nuggets that make it especially hard. First off, you have to forgive even if they don't deserve it. Ah, oh, now that, that, that's the nugget in the biscuit right there, guys, that you have to forgive even if they don't deserve it. Oh, guys, 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 that's hard. That's hard. If, if you haven't had to deal with something that irritating in your life, you must not be very old. I mean, <laughs> oh. And then the second little, little thing that makes this especially hard is you have to forgive them even if they don't ask, even if they never apologize, even if they, even if they keep on doing it. Oh, even if they keep on doing it, guys. Oh, man. Okay, so then the fifth thing that I want to specifically mention with a controlled mouth. Oh, man. We're talking about everything, guys. We're talking about our actions. We're talking about our attitudes. Now we're talking about our mouths. God, give us a break. Let me just have my thoughts to myself, and I can backbite them in my head, and we'll all be good. Why do you require so much of me, God? James 3.10 says, From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. And I will say there's a difference between occasional constructive criticism in a good way and continual critiquing. This is how you tell the difference. Continual critiquing usually happens either every day or every month or every other month, somewhere in the span like that. Occasional, um, uh, what, what did I call it? Occasional constructive criticism is where once in maybe a year or two you have some advice. See the difference? Once in like a year or two. Like, okay, I've known Chuck here for, uh, let's say I've known him for 12 years. You know, I've noticed for the past eight years he's been doing this. You know, I might want to just say something. So I take him as a friend without taking him in front of people and say, hey, you know, I notice that you do this. I'm not trying to nitpick you any or anything. I'm just saying if you do this, you might have better results. I didn't have to attack him, you know what I mean? And also, if you notice, it was a lot more easier for me to say something to him if we were friends than if I was just going people around with people nitpicking. I remember one time there was this very insecure teenage girl uh, who was having a really hard time in the church. And so she decided to wear a dress to the church. And uh, she hated it. She did not want to, to do that. She was just like, no, this is not me. I'm a tom tomboy. Just leave me alone. And so she does this. I think she honestly did it for her grandma more than anything, but she does this, and she comes, and you can see she's all like just, you know, doing it, taking one for the team kind of thing, and somebody goes up to her and criticizes how she's, how she's standing with the dress on. I was like, are you freaking joking? <laughs> like, come on, and this was in a church. I was like, guys. Anyways, you get what I'm getting at here, so let's just kind of move on there. Uh, we always think we can do it better, though. I will say that. No matter what it is, you're going to think that you can do it better than someone else until you do it. Oh, boy. And then you have to do it day in and day out. Oh, boy. And then you start eating your words. <laughs> Man, can I, can I unsign out for this? You know, we as Christians, we don't t we're not teaching a revolution in government. We're teaching a revolution in hearts. And I think that that's a lot more important than a revolution in the government. Because we're not setting up this perfect, fair government in America. We're trying to save people. Lament, uh, not a Lamentations, Ecclesiastes puts it like this, you don't know what's going to happen after you're dead. All the progress that you tried to establish in a government might be undone within a generation or two. You don't know. And so with that being said, yes, you should be social good. Those things are great. Those things are great, but they're not everything, and they're also not eternal. So just remember that. Um, and I think that this verse really has a lot to say about that. Uh, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. We're not, we're not trying to be rowdy and just cause a bunch of problems. If you remember the first verse that we looked at, he said so that we can live tranquil and quiet lives. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, the plan of God, what God has put in place, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Now, obviously... Things are a little bit different here than they were then. You know, we don't have kings. We have elected people. Um, that's fine. Just, once again, assuming that things stay civil in your conversations. This is what I mean by civil. Can you talk to somebody who supports 
Hillary Clinton for a running <laughs> for a <laughs> that's a good point um, for a for a running candidate. If your answer is an instant no, Isaiah, I'm just I'm just joking. Then that's probably a good symbol. <laughs> that's probably a good symbol that. See what I mean? You're not able to have civil conversations with with the supporters. See what I mean? You don't have to. I'm not saying you have to like a certain person who's running for politics or anything like that. But it's important to remember that you have to be civil with people who disagree with you. When you when you are witnessing to people about Jesus, you're not trying to get them to become a Republican or uh, anything like that. You know that their their political views, their economic views. That's not the point. The point is this: Do you believe in Jesus Christ for your salvation? Because I can guarantee you, God is not going to care at all in heaven whether you are red or blue. And honestly, I don't think you're going to care about it in heaven either. I think you're going to think a lot different than you're thinking now. Just throwing that out there. So let's plow through some more here. We are obligated to do what's right, even if they weren't perfect. We see a great example of this in Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right, unless they were wrong. Oh, no, it doesn't say that. Honor your father and mother unless they were wrong. Nope, it doesn't say that either. Which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. Now, do you know what's not fair, guys? The Bible never once, never once has a commandment for, for how parents should raise their children. But it says multiple times how children should submit to their parents. Man, oh man, wouldn't you like just have the last word in over your parents? You're wrong, and I've got biblical proof of it. But yet, it doesn't say that. So, there's just a few more things that I want to look at. Um, the bare minimum, now get this, I want you guys to lash on, latch on to this. The bare minimum requires maximum effort. What's the bare minimum that you have to contribute to these relationships? Your maximum effort. That's the bare minimum that you have to contribute. That's a very, very uh, important, important point. Anything less than your best is not good. I'm not saying you have to do better than everyone else. I'm saying you have to give your best. And anything less than you giving your best is not good. There was a lot of things that we used to do as pastors... And we decided, you know, this is not our best effort. So we stopped doing them. And then we did something else because it was our best effort. Doesn't that make sense? Remember that quote that I shared two weeks ago, do your best until you know to do better and then do better. We read these things that, that I've been talking about, but somewhere in our minds, we don't really apply them to, our, to, our, to our, the situations that we're going to. You know, we read the, we read the verses about honoring people, and we re read the verses about, you know, living our lives for other people and sacrifice and all those things. Okay, those are great things, but then we don't really ask ourselves, so how does this apply to my week? We don't slow down and say, now, who am I going to be in contact with this week that I can apply this to? For those of you um, who celebrate Thanksgiving, which I hope is all of you because turkey's too good. <laughs> I'm not joking. Um, but uh, I'm sure you are around family or people who sometimes irritate you. <laughs> You get where I'm going with that. So what are some verses that I can apply to these people? Well, some of the verses we just looked at would be nice. Now, I, I, I could have listed more, really, but I, I, it's not about a list. It's not about the five things that I mentioned. It's about a main point, and that main point is that there is an underlying attitude that we must have when we're dealing, with, when dealing in power struggles. There are some people who are just rebellious. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter what the government does, they'd rebel against it. It doesn't matter what the, what the pastor or, or church leadership says, they'd rebel against it. I mean, they're just rebellious. They love to rebel against anything. I mean, just pick something and they'll rebel, rebel against it. Hey, you know, uh, I really like Hondas. They stink. Fords all the way. Oh, yeah, I like Fords, too. Fords are terrible. Chevys all the way. It's like, uh, uh, uh. You know, some people just like arguing. Um, so here's, here's, here's the, it, it, I'm going to give you the underlying attitude in a very simple sentence that I'm going to make extremely complicated. And I could have simplified it, and I thought, no, I'm not going to. So the first word of this sentence is love. The underlying attitude that you have to, do, have, to have in any power struggle is love. In John 15, 13, it says, Greater love has no one than this, 
that one lay down his life for his friends. Would you say that you are laying down your life in this situation? Let me give you a few examples. Once again, this is not exhaustive. How do you talk to your kids? Do you talk down to them? It, it takes a lot of work to talk to your kids like they're people instead of like they're little drones. It's very difficult to do, especially when they start looping off and you're like, you know, without me, there would be no you, so you might want to watch your tone. Uh, you know, and it just gets a little bit like, eh. uh, another, another, uh, <laughs> another, another good example is bad-mouthing the boss. Would you say that you're laying down your life for them when you badmouth them? Well, maybe that's why you haven't gotten the raise. Another thing, uh, this applies more to men than anything else. Wives, did you know that wives want to talk? Does that surprise any men in here? See, what we do is we kind of go on autopilot, and we want to do minimal effort and get maximum results. So when our wives want to talk, we're like, are you done talking yet? I, I, we've talked, we've gone over it all, now I'm moving on, my brain is on something else, and you're interrupting my thoughts. Is there anything important that you're trying to say? And the truth is, no, there probably isn't anything important, but she just wants to talk. Now, see, for a guy, that's very hard to understand because we're about efficiency. We're about efficiency. If it's not efficient to carry on this conversation, we'd much rather just end it and move on. That's how guys think. How can I do the most and the, with the least? So when we, th- when we think about talking to our wives, we think of how can I get this conversation closed, transaction finished, before she has finished her breath. So she starts talking, we already have the solution in, in mind. Do this. Well, I haven't finished saying what I'm saying. Okay, go ahead and finish. Okay, now do this. See, we already decided how to fix her problem. We don't want to listen to the problem. We already got the solution. Just give us five seconds and we can solve it for you. But you know, this is something else that confuses me about women. They would rather have the problem continue and you listen to the problem than that you rush in and solve the problem for them. That blows my mind because I am in my man way of thinking. I think, okay, gracious, let me take care of this. And then in her woman way of thinking, she says, how about you start listening to me and stop talking? It's like, why would you want me to listen to you when I can just fix it and there won't be a problem anymore? Another thing that wives want is they want to be heard. It's not really so much about having an answer. A lot of times they respond better to you just saying, I understand, and then asking questions and then you giving a solution. They want to be heard. They want to be pursued. There's something inside of a woman that they want a man to desire them. And I guess that's part, and there's, there's, that goes for all of us. I mean, who doesn't want to be wanted? I mean, you know, that's, we all want to be wanted in a different way. Another thing that uh, I was thinking about when I was writing this, wives want romance. Now, see, that's hard for guys because when guys hear the word romance, they think sex. When women think of the word romance, they think of, you know, holding hands, cuddling, staying up late at night talking. I'm like, staying up late to talk? What? What? We just think a lot differently. So the question is there, is there love in how you're dealing with your power struggles? The second word in this sentence, sacrificially. Love sacrificially. Now this takes us to a very difficult verse, guys. Philippians 2, 2, 2, 5. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Nothing. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not look out for your own personal interests, but, sorry, but, one, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, that sounds really fine and well, except for when we start applying it to our lives. At, at work, for instance, am I there for a check or am I there for, to benefit the boss? In my marriage, would, you, would I say that in my marriage I am doing nothing from selfishness or empty conceit? In my marriage. So you start asking specific questions about this verse. Am I living this out with how I deal with this person, with how I deal with this person? What we do is we just blow past the verses, and we don't really stop to think, now, how does this apply to my life? Would I say that as a husband, I am doing nothing from selfishness or empty conceit? Would I say that as a father, I am doing nothing from selfishness or empty conceit? And I hear this a lot of times when I talk about this. You don't know about my wife. I don't care about your wife. We are called to be like Christ. I don't care what your kids are doing or your spouse is doing. You be like Christ. See the difference there? One says, I'm excused from becoming like Christ if they don't act like Christ. And the other one says, 
God, I want to learn. Which attitude do you think you should have? God, I want to learn. And so the, another little part to, this, to the sentence that we have here, love sacrificially with humility. And this takes us to a verse in Proverbs where it says things that God hates. You know, we talk a lot about what we hate. For instance, I hate pasoli. I've tried, guys. I really have. I hate pasoli. I really hate pasoli. I love Mexican food. I hate pasoli. Guys, I could eat enchiladas till my insides are red. I mean, well, my insides are red. How about that? I could eat them until they're on fire. How about that? Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, this is a list of things that God hates. There are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, that would be uh, thinking you're better than someone else, looking down on people, pride. Uh, a lying tongue, this one kind of goes without explanation, and it hands that shed innocent blood. This isn't just somebody who attacks somebody else. This is someone who takes advantage of, the, of people who can't defend themselves. It's, it's a whole idea. If you read through Proverbs, you'll kind of get the idea. Uh, a heart that devises wicked plans, when, you're th- when you think of how to get back at people in your heart, how to get back at that person who wronged you, how to, a heart that dev- devises evil, okay? Feet that run rapidly to evil, and a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. And then the last little part of the sentence I want to get across, love sacrificially with humility, while always obeying God. John 14, 21 is a very important verse. It says, He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Once again, there's a lot being said there, and I wish I had time to get into it, but we really just got to play through. Um, Sometimes God's going to do things that you don't like, and even if you don't like how God did something or is doing it, you still have to obey him. Sometimes, God, for instance, sometimes God takes somebody out of our life that we weren't ready to let go. You know what I mean? And this could be through death. It could be through betrayal. Sometimes God just says, okay, I'm taking this person out of your life. And it's like, God, I wasn't ready to say bye. Couldn't you just give me another day? And the thing is, even if God does something that you don't like, you still have to obey him. See, that, that's, that goes a little bit against our thinking because we have this mindset, Pastor was talking about this morning, where we vote for everything. And so it's like, okay, God, didn't like that. So it's like we feel like we, we can vote on it to God. You're like, <laughs> okay, God, <laughs> that did not get an A plus from me. You got maybe mm, D minus. Yeah, yeah, let, let's try this again, God. You, you better pick up your game. And it's like, no, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. We don't vote on God. And uh, so, okay, let's just look at a few things uh, to apply this, and we're, and we're done for the evening. But before I go to that, I, I do want to say this. You will either spend your time fighting for control, or you will invest your time wisely. Either you will spend your time fighting for control, always having to be the dominant one, trying to prove to your spouse that you're in control, trying to take and trying to fix everything with the government, trying to, trying to get your fingers in church leadership or trying to get your fingers in at work and trying to fix everything. You will always be either fighting for control in a power struggle or you will insp- instead spend your time wisely in an investment. See what I mean? You only have one life and you have to invest it in such a way that's, that's wise. And uh, one, way, one of the, way, the ways that you invest are the, the things that we were talking about, praying for them, those kinds of things, right? Doing the right thing, serving them as if, they were, as if you were doing it to God himself. You know, everyone has hopes and dreams, and, and many people think that their politicians or their relationships or their job will make them happy and fulfill them. They think that, that that's how their dreams will come about. And this is the real takeaway from all that, guys. Your job is not to change their minds. Some people out there have dreams and they think politicians are going to bring them about. Some people are convinced that if they just get in that relationship, then they'll be happy. Some people are convinced your job is not to change your minds. God's got all that under control. You keep praying for them. You keep doing what you should be doing. Now get this. Your job is to two, uh, three, three very quick things. First off, be a light in the darkness. Be a light in the darkness. If there was no darkness, you couldn't possibly let your light shine, could you? We think we have to be 
absolved of all life's difficulties so that that way we can show people Christ because everything will be right. But if there was no darkness, you couldn't really be a light. Doesn't that just make sense? If people didn't have struggles, you couldn't walk with them through the fire. Doesn't that just make sense? If you didn't have a war you couldn't win, how would God possibly show you that he's the God of the impossible? That just makes sense. But what we want to do is we want to strip God of his right to be God and say, God, I want everything perfect in how I want here on earth right now. I don't care who pays for it. This is the way I want things. And, you know, God just doesn't really work like that. Um, a second thing, your job is to refuse to be troublesome. Refuse. Refuse to be that person who's always causing a, t- causing a rough about everything, always rebelling against the government for this thing or the other thing. So we can live a quiet and tranquil life. See the difference there? We're not trying to cause some great revolution in the world. We're, we're trying to show people Christ. People shouldn't say, oh, there's another Christian being, being a real troublemaker. Like that, that shouldn't be what Christians are known for. There, there's, there's a group of Christians, or they call themselves Christians. It's either Hillsboro or Westboro. Help me out here, guys. What? Westboro Baptist Church. And they do this thing like picket homosexual funerals and that kind of stuff. And let me ask you this. Do you think that's showing the love of Christ by picketing a homosexual person's funeral? I don't think so. And I don't remember Jesus ever going on and on and on about homosexuals. So maybe a good point there would be, the good takeaway there to be, is that there's more important things than constantly trumping on, on things like that. Maybe we should be showing love more than pronouncing openly and repeatedly over and over and over again the evils of the society. Look, they don't have Jesus. Don't expect them to live by the laws of Jesus. Show them Jesus and you be the light in their darkness. Not by, not by condemning them every chance you get, but by serving them. What did Jesus do to people who were dark? He served them and even died for them. Be willing to serve and even die for them. Because past the sin is a person that God loves. Past the sin is a person that God loves. Never forget that. Never, ever forget that. The third thing, give it your best. You don't have to be perfect, but you do have to give it your best. So give it your best. And I want to close out with Proverbs 23, 20 verse 3, not 23, 20 verse 3. It says, Keeping away from strife is an honor for a man, but any fool will quarrel. Any idiot can shoot his mouth off. It's really easy. But there's something better than having our opinion heard, I think. So we're going to go ahead and close there. Next week we're going to look at the last of the four questions in Power Struggles. If you will join me, please.